morning. Church has been good so far. Here. Wow. Okay. <clears throat> I'm usually when I'm up here, I'm holding a microphone, and so it's like I want to hold on to something, but um, I'm not used to the earpiece. So we're gonna we're gonna uh, look in uh, Luke 19. You don't have to turn there if you don't want to, because I will tell you about it. Now, Jesus, you know, next week is Palm Sunday. And uh, Jesus was heading toward Jerusalem, and everybody had the palm branches, and they were yelling out glories to God, and they were, they were, telling, uh, they were yelling out miracles. And they thought he was going to be their physical king. We all understand that. Instead of a spiritual king that he was going to be the redeemer, the savior, d the deliverer. And then when we look in Luke 19, and this is the only uh, book of the gospel that says this, it says when he, the beginning is the same, but when he approached Jerusalem, he saw the city and wept over it. And then he begins to talk about proclamations toward Jerusalem. And he says, you know, your enemies are going to surround you. They're going to overtake you. In verse 44, it says, they'll level you to the ground, your children within you, and they will not leave one stone upon another. And this is a part that's different. Because you did not recognize the time of your visitation. So I believe that not only did he cry for Jerusalem or weep for Jerusalem, but he wept because they did not understand they did not know the times and the season that they were living in. And so we're going to, I was talking to Craig, and Craig can come up. I was talking to Craig uh, last Sunday, and I was discussing a dream I had, which I will share with all of you. And as we were talking, we realized that the Lord had been laying the same thing on both of our hearts about visitation. So go ahead. When Trudy was sharing with me about the dream, I would mentioned to her, I said, I, said I, I think that we're in the time that Jesus is just going to have his visitation, not only on the earth, but in the church. The problem with having the visitation in the church is, and, and she just said it, is we may not recognize it. Because it's going to be different than something we've ever seen before. Now she is reading out of Luke, and I was actually reading out of Mark 6. Mark 6, starting in verse 30, remember, uh, they were on the shoreline, and they were having, uh, or, or the disciples were tired, and they said, look, you know, we need to get these people some food. Um, Lord, what do we do? We want to send them home. And the Lord says, feed them. <laughs> they wanted money then to feed the people, right? And Jesus says, what do you got for fish? What do you got for loaves? And so he fed the people, and there was a miracle that took place. Amen? Okay, so now what happens? Now we're taking to the shore. The people are fed. He, he shared what he had to share. Then he told his disciples to get in the boat. So then they got in the boat, and they started to cross uh, over the sea that they were in, and contrary winds came. Now these were experienced fishermen, right? They were experienced. So the storm wasn't... It wasn't bad enough for them to bail or to get out, but they were in the middle of the sea, the winds were contrary, the wind was blowing against them, and they were rowing, rowing, and they were not getting anywhere. So then what happens is Jesus is already out in the sea, and he's walking by, and they didn't recognize him. And then he spoke, and then they thought it was a ghost. Until he spoke again, and he said, and then they recognized, this is Jesus. Jesus. It was their time for visitation, but here's what happens. is because we toil in the things that we know, and the people that row like the disciples, because they're trying to get somewhere in their own way, in their own fervor, in their own passion that they had, that they had forgot already what had happened on the shore where the miracles had taken place. And then Jesus showed up. And here's, here's the cool part about that. Jesus showed up, called on to them, got into the boat, and immediately the winds were calmed, 
and they were on the other side. It was that quick. Can you say amen? So they went from despair to destiny like that. Amen? That's the visitation of the Lord. In Genesis 17, chapter 17 and chapter 18, we're going to just spend a little time with Abraham. Now, Abraham had a visitation of the Lord. When you look at chapter 17, God shows up. And when God shows up, he begins to give him a new name. He, he immediately starts addressing his identity. He gives him a new name. He, gives, he says that Sarah will have a new name. Not only that, but she's going to have a child. And then he begins to make this covenant with him about being a father of many nations. And Abraham laughs when he begins to tell him that uh, Sarah's going to have a baby. Now to go ahead and uh, have this covenant, uh, a symbol of this covenant, he had to get circumcised. And then we go ahead and we see uh, Genesis 18 where where Abraham is sitting in front of a tent. Now he's been circumcised. He's sitting in front of a tent and he's waiting. Now remember, he already had a visitation in Genesis 17. And he's sitting there and he's waiting. And then he waits some more. It says he's sitting in the heat of the day. And then he waits some more. And he waits some more. And then we as a church needs to begin to wait upon the Lord. And it doesn't matter if, if we have got pain going on because he was circumcised. Man, it wasn't comfortable sitting in front of his tent. There was also, I mean, the heat of the day. He was probably sweating on top of it. But he began to wait because he didn't want to miss another visitation of the Lord. And uh, uh, as he waited, all of a sudden he saw God and a couple of angels. He saw three people. And you know what he did? He didn't sit there and continue to wait. He got up and began to pursue God. And that's the way we need to be. We need to wait upon the Lord. And then we get up because we're going to have a visitation and we're going to go ahead and we're going to pursue God. About two weeks ago, like I said, I had a dream. And uh, I really feel like the dream is for the church. And in the dream, I sat in a chair, and I couldn't see anything. I couldn't hear anything. And all of a sudden, you know how on some of your computers, you'll have pictures of family, and it kind of pops up, and it fades away. Another picture kind of pops up, fades away again. And it was like that. Now, I remember three pictures, but it was many pictures that would pop up and go away and pop up. The first picture was a military man in a tank. And when I saw that picture, Jesus was there too. And then I saw a family picnicking, and Jesus was there too. And then I saw some people at the beach, and they were playing around. And you know who was there too? Jesus was there too. The second part of the dream, Andy motioned me to come into the sanctuary, and I kind of walked to the back of the sanctuary and there are three people dressed in white, and they're just dancing down this middle aisle. And then there was a man with sandy brown hair on, on the right side, and he was standing there with a book. There was music playing, but there was no worship team. And then he begins to speak from the book, and he says, Arise and shine, for your light has come, and the glory of the Lord has risen upon you. The third part of the dream, I go ahead and go over to the elevators, and Craig Miller, he's just frantically looking around. He goes, Trudy, put 600 chairs in the sanctuary. I am looking for more chairs. And so he goes, and he actually finds more chairs. And then the last thing that happens is I'm downstairs in the office. Um, I have an office downstairs, by the way. And uh, there, I, there is a big table that I knew I was going to feed a lot of people. And I had placemats, so I was trying to decide which placements I was going to have. And, and Josiah, my kids are kind of running around. They're kind of teasing Josiah. 
And all of a sudden, I go to sit in a chair again. When I sit in the chair, everything goes dark, and I can't hear anything. I know, that, I know there are kids running around, but I just can't hear anything. And then I hear the words, I want to take you deeper, but your thoughts keep getting in the way. And also, my right arm was swollen at the time. I couldn't use it. And in the dream, I said, I have heard the voice of God. So we're going to kind of go back through my dream step by step. I'll tell you what, when we start talking about thoughts, we're all going to kind of get a little uncomfortable. Okay? So first of all, we want a visitation. We need to see God as a God of wonders. When I saw the pictures coming in Jesus, it didn't matter if they were in battle, Jesus was there. And it didn't matter if things were going smooth and they were having a picnic, Jesus was there. And I remember thinking how amazed I was that no matter what happened, God was there. Now when you think of the God of wonders, a lot of times we've sang that song. It's an older song about God being the God of wonders. But when you look up the word wonders, it means awe, it means amazement, it means curiosity, and it means surprises. He's a God of surprises. We need to be very curious for the Lord. Now the opposite of, or the near antonym of it is, now you guys are going to follow me as soon as I say it, is apathy, tiredness, no joy, and boredom. When we lose our awe of God, we become apathetic. We become spiritually tired. We become spiritually bored, like, should I even do this anymore? And we lose our joy. We need to continue to see God as a God of wonders. When Jesus was on earth, he healed for, I mean, he fed 4,000 people. He healed the deaf. He, uh, he healed the people of their, uh, that were blind. He, you know, he called the storm. He walked on water. He was continually showing them wonders. And people were continually amazed and had awe. The second part of uh, my dream was the man standing here. And I really believe like uh, the people that were dancing were angels. And it says that Jesus sits at the right hand of the Father. He was on the right hand of the stage. And he begins to say, Arise, shine, for your light has come, and the glory of the Lord is risen. And that's, that's uh, Isaiah 60, verse 1. And at first when I thought about it, because I've heard that verse forever. You know, and so for me to hear that verse, first I was, I was interested because it was in a dream. But more than that, I was like, kind of a little, like, I've heard it so many times. What's God going to speak to me about arise, shine, for the light has come? And when I began to look up the word arise, it means not just to get up and start going. Because a lot of us, I'll be real honest in here, a lot of us have learned to get up and start walking out our faith. But it means to go to the next level. It also means to break out. So God is calling us even further in him, even deeper, I mean higher in him, that we're supposed to go, uh, we're supposed to uh, go higher and break out. The word shine means, um, it actually means to set on fire, not just to light, but to set on fire. So arise, shine, for your light has come, and the glory of the Lord has risen upon you. And when you go to the next verse, it talks about darkness will cover the earth, and deep darkness will cover uh, the people. And if we look today at today, we see a lot of darkness. I mean, there's a lot of times I watch the news, and I go, oh, man, what's going on with our world? I mean, is the devil winning? I mean, come on, we're, what's going on? But it says, because you can see how God's focus is different, but the Lord will rise upon you and his glory will appear upon you. So it didn't matter if things were getting darker. The, the glory of the Lord will rise upon you. When you begin to, uh, when you begin to read the rest of Isaiah 60, it talks about 
you know, lift your eyes and see and, and that people will come from afar. In verse 5, it talks about the wealth of nations. Uh, in verse 10, it talks about my favor being upon you. So when you begin to rise and you begin to shine and the presence of God is upon you and his glory is upon you and, and you're lit up for him, you're going to see favor. You're going to see wealth. You're going to see people coming to Jesus. You're going to have honor. You're going to have peace. Boy, that sounds wonderful, doesn't it? When you get to verse 22, you know, last, last month we were kind of talking about acceleration. God had given our church the word acceleration. Um, I heard from some other people that he's speaking that to the church universal um, acceleration. And if you look at verse 22, it says, I, the Lord, will hasten its time. In other verse, verses, it says, in other versions, it says, I will do it quickly. God wants to do something very quickly. He wants to have a visitation with us. And I'm going to kind of sit for a little while in this next section. Because if you remember, I was sitting in the chair. My arm was swollen. And God said, I want to take you deeper, but I can't because of your thoughts. You know, I talked to a couple of people last week who were just sitting around, and I talked to them one at a time, and they both said, man, my thoughts. Wish I could get over those thoughts. God wants to take us deeper, but our thoughts get in the way. And so even though we're going to talk about thoughts, some of you are going to think, well, she's talking about me, and I'm not thinking about anyone in particular when we do this. But we do need to go deeper in God, and we have to overcome our thought life. Gandhi says, your beliefs become your thoughts. Your thoughts become your words. We know your words become your actions. Your actions become your habits. Your habits become your values. Your values become your destiny. In Proverbs 4.23, it says to guard your heart above all else, for it determines the course of your life. I'm here to tell you to guard your heart. And it's just not you guys. It's me too. It was me too. Uh, the devil will try to get you to think wrong thoughts, negative thoughts. He will try to twist the words. He will go ahead and try to deceive you by words that people have said or not said. And I will tell you this. If you have a thought that doesn't line up with the word of God, you need to take it captive. You need to guard your heart. A couple weeks ago, probably three weeks ago, I really got bombarded by the enemy. I mean, I had so many thoughts. And I'll tell you what, they were negative thoughts. They were not healthy thoughts. And I could have just sat there and just kept thinking about it, could have lingered in it a little bit, because I don't know what it is about negative thoughts. For some people, it kind of makes you feel good. For me, it kind of sometimes makes me feel good. And I don't know why. I'm sure Gloria and Nancy will tell me later. <laughs> I have a great relationship with Gloria and Nancy, so they, they will tell me later. But <laughs> so what happens is when you believe negative thoughts, even if it's not true, even if it's not true, it becomes your reality, it's true to you. It doesn't matter if it's not true. When we entertain those thoughts, even if it's not true, it becomes your reality, and I can't tell you it's not. But our thought life needs to line up with the Word of God. <clears throat> and the other thing is if you wait to deal with your heart, or you, hate, you wait to deal with those negative thoughts, like if we would just take our time, like I said, and kind of linger with those thoughts or take a few days, what happens is those thoughts get deeply rooted in our lives, and it's harder to deal with. So all of a sudden, you know, and we live out in the country, and so we'll have small little weeds, but we have huge weeds out there. And it's hard to even take it out because the roots go so deep. And you have to work harder for your freedom. So you need to be careful of your thoughts. And some of you, 
Like, I'll tell you, when I was... Uh, when I was a teenager, I really felt like, and I remember, Craig was my youth leader at one point, and I remember, this is one thing I remember, he said, he was speaking, he goes, if you were the only person on the face of this earth, Jesus would have died for you. And everybody says that's good, right? But to me, if I was the only person on the face of this earth, there was no way Jesus was going to die for me. Could not understand it. Was he speaking the truth? He was speaking the truth. Was it reality to me? No. Was it truth to me? No. The truth to me was I was unloved. God didn't love me like everybody else. Maybe if we had a pile of people, or a group of people, pile doesn't sound good. Maybe if we had a group of people, sorry. Maybe if we had a group of people, and he died for all of us, like he did anyways, right? Because he loves us, but not if I was the only person. So I actually had to go on a love journey with the Lord, where he began to show me how much he loves me and how much he cares for me. And you know, there are some things that you may believe that might be from 15 years ago, that that's when the reality of it came for you. Maybe it was 10 years ago. Maybe somebody spoke something to you that, you know, that God doesn't love you, or you have no destiny, or why were, you, why were you even born? Okay, so all of a sudden it becomes reality to me. But you have to figure out at what point it became the reality so you can go ahead and go back and, and fix it. And like I said, um, Gloria and Nancy are great. Sorry, great with, with working with that. The next thing, so we have to guard our mouth. Because it starts with, or guard our heart, because it starts with our thoughts. And then what happens? It comes out our mouth. So our negative thoughts. No one loves me. Um, did you hear what that person said about me? Okay, you start to dwell. Um, I, I can't believe what my boss did and what he said to me. Okay, you begin to dwell on those thoughts. What happens? It comes out your mouth. In Psalms 141, Verse 3, it says, set a guard over my mouth, Lord. Keep watch over the door of my lips. So not only are we supposed to guard our heart, we're to guard our lips, guard our mouth. <clears throat> not only do you want to do that, and later I'm going to go to the story of, of David. And in the middle of the night, God was just showing me some neat stuff that kind of tied all this stuff in, but... You need to open your mouth and speak the word. So you got these negative thoughts going on, and you're like, what do I do? You speak the word, just like Jesus did. And you know, the enemy came against his identity. It says, if you are the son of God, command these stones to become bread. The second time, he goes against them again. If you are the son of God, right? So it was constantly identity. That was Matthew 4. So when, and it wasn't like he sat around and waited, thought about those thoughts. Well, should I do that? Am I really the son? He didn't do any of that, did he? He spoke right away. And to know what the word says, you're able to speak the word. If you're not spending time in the word, you're not going to know that you can speak the word. And then the negative thoughts keep going. Negative thoughts. So we gotta, you got to stop it right away. And I was going to finish my story. You know, like I said, a couple of weeks, I got really bombarded with those negative thoughts. And I knew I had to do something right away because sometimes it produces emotion. I mean, okay. So all of a sudden you're feeling emotion that you didn't realize you were feeling. So here's an example. Let's say uh, your wife and your husband's at home with the kids and you're thinking, I sure hope he picked up at the house. And then you start thinking about more and more, and you're thinking about it all the way home. I sure hope he did that. And all of a sudden, you come home, and you're angry. Why? Because you have been entertaining negative thoughts. It caused you to be angry. Sometimes we entertain negative thoughts. causes us to be more jealous. Boy, that person was up there again. They spoke a word, or 
oh, I can't believe the worship leader. She led like five weeks in a row. She just wants to be seen. And it's actually a jealousy that comes out of you. So you need to, uh, you need to speak the word. A lot of times we'll, th- we'll think, you know, I've just messed up my life. I can't do anything now. Well, what do you do? You speak the word. Jeremiah 29, 11 says, For I know the plans for you, says the Lord. They are plans for good, not disaster, to give you a future and a hope. The plans that God has for me are good. The plans that God has for you are good. It's to give you hope. He's going to give you a future. And David would encourage himself in the Lord. And one way to encourage yourself in the Lord is by using, some, using the scriptures that fit the negative thoughts that you're using, that you're having. And if you don't know what scriptures you use, you know what I do? I Google. I Google verses on fear, or I Google verses on, uh, I don't know, I can't think right now. So whatever you want to uh, use the verses for. And then second of all, you need to be thankful. Because when you're thankful, it causes you to get the eyes off of yourself and onto God. When you have negative thoughts, a lot of times all you're doing is thinking about yourself. And it causes you to think about God. In 1 uh, Samuel 17, and I'm close to being done. So in 1 Samuel 17, Goliath says, why do, you, why do you come out and line up for battle? Am I not a Philistine? Are you not a servant? And uh, choose one of your men and come down to me. And in verse 10 he says, this day I defy the armies of, of Israel. So Goliath was speaking words that were negative, And it made them fearful. So some of our negative thoughts, and you can I'm sure they were sitting there thinking about everything he said. They probably had it memorized because he kept coming out and taunting them. Who do you think you are? Who are you? You have no right to do it. And what did it do? I'm bigger than you are. I'm a Philistine. Oh, you are a servant of Saul. It caused him to get fearful. Those negative thoughts can cause you to get fearful also. So then David's told by his dad to go out by, uh, to find his brothers and to go out there. And when he goes out there, Goliath again begins to shout the defiance. And they're like, have you seen the giant? Have you seen the giant, David? And, and then David begins to wonder, begins to ask, what will happen if somebody actually kills the Philistine? Who is this man that defies the army of God? And if you notice, it says David's brother heard him speaking. And it says he gets angry. Why are you here? Who's taking care of the sheep? He's, he probably thought, had those negative thoughts for a while. Why? I mean, I can't believe my, my brother David's here. He's the youngest one in the family, and I don't understand why he's here. And Who's taking care of the sheep? And he even begins to personally attack him by saying, I know it's because you're prideful and you're deceitful. Okay, you know that he's been thinking about it because he's had a reaction to the words. He gets very angry. And David, you know, David's not sure what to do, so he goes over to another person. This other person tells him the same thing. And it says they respond the same way. So they're like saying it again. Who are you? Why aren't you home taking the sh- care of the sheep? Why are you here? And, and it says they respond it's the same, so they're probably getting angry too. And then David had a chance at that point to start neg- thinking negative thoughts. Well, nobody likes me. Every person I talk to, they're wondering why I'm here. Every person I talk to, they're wondering who's taking the sheep, and they just think I'm prideful, and I just, I'm going to deceive everybody. But did he do that? No, he didn't do that. He did not. He guarded his heart. He set a guard over his mouth even. He encouraged himself in the Lord. He goes to Saul, and the, you know what King Saul says to him? There is no way you can win this battle. There's no way you can fight. Well, 
What could David think? Well, leadership not backing me. Leadership doesn't think I can do it. He could have started entertaining thoughts. And then he began to open his mouth. And let me explain one other thing before I talk about uh, David opening his mouth. Did you see that these guys are ineffective? Like his brother's ineffective? He's not going out there fighting the giant. The other people he talked to are not effective. They're not doing anything. They're entertaining thoughts, right? They're entertaining thoughts. They're very ineffective. And in my dream, I had a swollen right arm, and the Lord says, I want to take you deeper, but your thoughts are getting in the way. So he wants to take us deeper, but our thoughts are getting in the way, and it's affecting our authority. It's affecting our, how effective we are. And this is, what, this is what David says in verse 37. He begins to open his mouth, begins to just encourage himself in the Lord. It says, the Lord who rescued me from the paw of the lion and the paw of the bear will rescue me from the hand of the Philistine. He began to encourage himself. He was not going to allow those negative thoughts to get in the way. In James 3, I just want to say this quick. When we talk about thoughts going out our mouth, it talks about for those of you who are in the James class, you got to chapter 3, right? Um, it talks about the tongue being a fire and it, how it can set a whole forest on fire. And in verse 9 it says, We can bless our Lord and Father, and we can also curse men out of the same mouth. And the men that we curse are made in the same likeness of God. Verse 11 says, Does a fountain send out fresh and bitter water? Can a salt water produce fresh? We have to be careful of the thoughts we think. We've got to be careful of the words that come out of our mouth. In Philippians 4.8, it says, Fix your thoughts on what is true and honorable and right and pure and lovely and admirable. Think about things that are excellent and worthy of praise. God is is wanting to visit us. He's wanting to visit your family. He's wanting to visit this nation. But at so, some place along the way, we've lost our awe for God. We've kind of lost our wonder for him. And we've become apathetic. And we become, you know, we become bored. We become tired. But he wants to take us higher. And he wants us to rise. And he wants us to be set on fire. And when the glory of the Lord begins to come, we begin to see favor. We begin to see peace. We begin to see honor and wealth. And God's blessing comes. And he says he'll do it quickly. And he wants us to go deeper. But our thoughts. I'll tell you what, after I had the dream, I cried. God, I, I want so much to go deeper with you. I really want to go higher with you. But my thoughts get in the way. For some reason, I can't think I can't do certain things, or maybe it's a negative thought that I allow to entertain. Lord, I pray you'd forgive me. Lord, I, I, just, I just pray for everybody in this church, and, and I just we really have been feeling that the Lord's been wanting to have a visitation with everybody. But for some reason, we just get distracted and we just can't sit. We can't just wait. It's like we can't sit and wait and wait and wait like Abraham did. But we have things to do. It's like we don't have time to even pursue God. But Lord, I pray that you take us. We, take us higher. Take us deeper. Help us to learn to even control our thoughts. Lord, I pray that, you would, that we would continue to have the awe, we would see, have the curiosity, the surprises of God in the name of Jesus. Amen.